What is the state of affair of Pink Floyd? I mean, nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows, nor do we. Um, I mean, we haven't, I would say that we definitely have not um, agreed that it's all over and finished. Mm -hmm. that we feel that it still exists and it's sitting there waiting to be revitalized if we want to. Now, I think things have changed a little bit because David and myself both feel now that we would like to revitalize it. I mean, about two years ago, no one was very interested in it other things to do. I think David and myself now would like to get going again. Why is that? What, why? Why? What, what sort of makes it Well, I think David and myself probably, we've done a bit more so of work in the past, and I think we see that as something um, that teaches us quite a lot, and it's a sort of development that we could then put back into the band. I think Roger saw his last solo album as a sort of alternative to Pink Floyd. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, you'd have to ask him really to get full what he really thinks. But I, I think um, now Dave and myself both see, still would like to go back. It's partly because we've both done, outside the band, very different things to the band. So the band still represents an alternative, a sort of, you know, something different to do. Um, I think Roger might either... Uh, he might change his mind if he felt that um, the rest of us were sort of feeling strong and wanting to do something and had some suggestions. I think he would feel specifically hates the idea of having to go back and do it all and us then join in. Uh, yeah. What about um, Rick I mean, Is he completely out? Well, he, in theory, he did leave, but, um, yes, that's, that's what I'm asking. but having said that, I, again, I would think that he would come back if he was asked. No, on the, I mean, on the outside looking, um, the Pink Floyd, it, it seems that you are too serious about your own projects, you know. It's, it's why it seems unlikely that you would get together, you know what I mean? What, they were seri too serious about our outside projects? Mm, that's right, yeah. I think, uh, I think we have been, but I think there's still a sort of, um, there's an interest in, in what's possible as a band, because, you know, a big a sort of well-established band does have the potential to do things that are impossible mm -hmm. as individuals. You know, Dave, I mean, I think Dave doing solo things, he's really enjoyed it, and he likes the atmosphere of playing music just as music without the big show and so on. But I think in spite of that, there's still a, an interest and a delight in doing the, the other sort of mm -hmm. performance, the other sort of show. So I don't think, I, I mean, I think it's one of those things where perhaps the interest died away, that can be revitalized. What, interesting Pink Floyd? Yeah. I mean, what, you, are, you, are, you are very wrong in that. I don't think that interest has ever died. Maybe not. I'm not, not Have feeling. you got any ideas already for uh, future of Pink Floyd? Uh, no, because I think um, it would, before anything else, the first thing to do would be to make a record. Yeah. And it would depend very much upon the nature of the record, whether, uh, you know, I mean, there's always that possibility of, of revitalizing the old show, or one of the old shows, mm. but I think we'd probably rather look to see if we had some new music and some different ideas. What about, um, how, did you, <coughs> how did you react when um, um, your boss, <laughs> when there was a, uh, what was it called, Hitchhiker show at uh, mm. Oscott? How did you re react towards it? I mean, have you been there? Or? Yes. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I mean, it was that thing of... Uh, I didn't like, particularly, to hear our music played by other people. That's I what mean, I wanted to, to I know, you know, because uh, it's sort of your child, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, the, the other, the rest of the show, fine. But I still think it was, you know, I'd rather we'd have done it than... Uh, I mean, I've not necessarily done that particular show. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean, yeah. Did he ask you about it? Uh, well, oh, right. we talked about recording that piece as a, as a Pink Floyd track, but really it was very much Roger's solo thing. Oh, what I mean, did he ask you about, um, did Playing he tell you that he would like to play old Pink Floyd? Oh, yes, yes, because we agreed that he could use the old film, we had oh, some old film and so on. And, you know, I don't think I'd have ever felt it was right to say to him, no, he can't do it, because a lot of it were things that he wrote. Um, and I think we're all entitled to play our old material if we want to with other people. You know, you could never say you can't do it, but no, I didn't like it. I mean, I, did, I mean, I, I might even have liked the music, but it made me feel bad to, to watch it. That was an interesting point in that, uh, that 
the type of thing he wanted it to be employed to. Well, I think so, to sort of say... Well, half of the show was the whole Pink Floyd, isn't it? But, but I mean, his own solo, the material. Yes, to make it another Pink Floyd why, why record. Why nothing came out of the Why? Why? why it wasn't it made by... No, because I think, I mean, it sounds silly, because the wall, um, I have to try and explain it. I think the wall was, you know, it was Roger's, Roger's writing, Roger's idea, yeah. and so on. But it's everyone was sympathetic to it. They liked the idea, and we had the demos, and who liked it and wanted to work on it and do what we could. But the Hitchhiker, it was much more something that we heard and felt was very personal, more personal to him, that we were perhaps less sympathetic to, and that he should do on his own. So there was a sort of... I mean, I don't want it to sound as though we said we didn't want to do it and didn't like it, because it wasn't quite like that. It was much more a thing of agreeing that that was his personal view, whereas the wall was a personal view, but one that we uh, were sympathetic with. Uh, you did a second show at um, Telescott, in the wall, yeah. uh, to be included in the film. That's right. Which uh, never made the film. That's right. So, I mean, how... Have you seen the film afterwards? I mean, have you seen the finished copy? Some of it. It's, uh, it's... Well, the reason why we didn't use it um, was... Well, there were two reasons, really. I mean, one, I think it was so the film we got wasn't that brilliant. Not that. But the main thing was that once we started to use Alan Parker, the idea of the film changed slightly, and there was no place for it in the film anymore. And I think that was the right decision. I think the film became a story and became a, a proper um, piece of... Uh, I was going to say fiction, but it became more believable because it was total fiction, whereas if there'd been a sudden bit of documentary of us mm -hmm. in it, it would have all been fragmented and not made sense anymore. But, um, and someone put it very well, I think Alan said, the thing is that if you'd had it in there, it was almost like having a narrator, you know, as you do at the beginning of a play or something, explaining the whole thing to people, which was unnecessary, it was a sort of unnecessary thing to sort of say, and, and I think that was right. So uh, you cannot give me any reaction uh, about the film if you haven't seen the whole lot. The whole lot of um, what of the live stuff? No, no, the wall. Oh no, the I've film. seen the film. Oh, you've seen? Oh yeah, <laughs> hundreds of times. No, no, I'm talking about the the, the film, the Alan Parker's film, the finished film. Of the wall. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and the, the, how did you view it? I liked it. I thought it was. Uh, yeah, I think he did a very good job. No. I mean, we were quite near to the uh, to the original idea than anybody else. I mean, it was probably him as well. Yeah, I mean, I think he he made it an, another or helped create another version of of the story, and I think it works very well. I think uh, it's quite a tough film, and I think that's good for a rock film. I think most you know most rock things are rather ephemeral and that at least has some lasting quality in it because it's fairly tough it, okay it's, a lot of it's depressing and violent and everything else but um, it's life is not all rosy exactly yeah. um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about the cars I'm, I'm really um, you know it is uh, what um, rich men's uh, toys aren't they mm. I mean you really have to have a um, good backing to be able to drive cars like you have uh, miniatures around. Yes. Um, oh, I'm, uh, through music I've been able to realise my wildest dreams. I uh, really, uh, I'd accept that. And also through music I've been able to, to some extent, I mean it's one of those great, one of those very unfair things, but wonderful for me, which is that um, people are more interested in some crazed rock and roll drummer driving than in someone else. So that if you're looking for a sponsor or to suggest to someone that you should drive their car, they know they'll perhaps get a bit more press if you're in the car than perhaps someone who's a slightly better driver. So for something like uh, Le Mans, where it's a very expensive race, or well, well, certainly the most expensive sports car race, you're in a slightly stronger position to go out and look for a drive or get involved in a team or whatever. So it has double benefits at times. You've raised five times at Le Mans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not more? I mean, you not this year. Uh, not this year because there was no, there wasn't. I, I only want to race there if I think that the car is right and the team are right and that uh, I, and that I would fit into it. That 
um, my position, then it would be mm. useful. I mean, having said that thing about people might, I might yeah. get some use as a, um, to the, from a press aspect. I don't want to be there as the idiot, you know, who then is so much slower than the other drivers or whatever, or that they don't really want in the car. I mean, I don't want to do it if it all works out. Um, and there just wasn't a, a drive this year. But I would have liked... I was a bit spoiled last year because I had a drive in the 956 Porsche, and that is so good. You know, the thought of getting in something that was felt less good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I detect a um, sort of a doubt when you talk about yourself as a, as a driver? Oh, yeah. Do you doubt your doubt. ability? Oh, yes, but I think I doubt my ability in, uh, in most things. I mean, I, it's that feeling that... It's the same with um, music, really. It was a drummer that you, you think, well, I'm not really that good, but I've been lucky because I've been in the Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. or, um, and so it's, it's very... That's what's very good for, for one. Uh, to work yes. with other people because yeah. it teaches you that actually they suffer from the same doubts and so on and I think most people do and you need that's why it's so important to get out because if you don't you'll just never get out again you'll just always be stuck unable to, to play with other people which is one of the great satisfactions of, of music I understand is the only I mean that is a doubt is the only way that you can progress that you can better yourself yeah. whatever you do think, yeah. if you don't doubt if you think oh I'm uh, God's gift to, to mankind yeah. is something that you finish. And, and, yeah, mm. that's right. You end up like uh, Bob Dog. <laughs> <Dog. laughs> no, really, I mean, uh, I'm really intrigued, but I don't know much about the cars, the, the, I mean, especially the racing cars. Have you ever been near um, Formula One, for example, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, not really. That is too different. I mean, that's very specialised. You need to be totally dedicated. Um, just, it's sort of a bit like talking about professional tennis, you know, that you can be a good amateur tennis player, but then you can't just, uh, say if someone said, you're really good at amateur tennis, why aren't you playing at Wimbledon against McEnroe? Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, because it's more difficult, you know, it's another yeah. level. But it's interesting, it's, uh, I have to say, you're the only journalist who's actually um, picked up on that thing about doubt and, you know, whether people do feel uneasy about um, things they do. Well, I, I presume we do all. Maybe, maybe some people don't, uh, you know, confess, but yeah. I'm the first one. I mean, you know, it's the only way to do it. Mm. No, I think that's right. Um, well, I mean, mm, so, I didn't know until, uh, I don't know, yesterday, the day before yesterday, when I was uh, reading through a park, that uh, you had a shop for um, Austin Martins. Yeah, that's right. Those um, vintage ones. Yes. And only only vintage ones. Just very specialised. Well, it's just a good way of doing it, I think. But you don't do anything in that, do you? <laughs> Not anymore. I mean, I still, um, I'm still the sort of overall director of it. But mm -hmm. uh, I used to actually work on the cars occasionally myself for fun. But um, I think there's one thing is time, obviously. That there's never time. But the second thing is, I like working on cars, but I'm not a professional. And one of the things with that garage is it now has a very good reputation, mm -hmm. I think. I sort of generally agreed on it, that we do very good work. And I think if you do, if you charge people a lot of money to do good work, you can't have someone who just is doing some spannering for fun. Mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to be absolutely certain that all the work you did was done by a professional and you can say, we did it properly and you must pay us for it, sort of thing, rather than saying, well, actually, I did that myself. <laughs> I'm sorry it fell off. <laughs> Have you got a big collection of cars? Uh, quite big, about um, 20, 20 plus. Well, so what do you do with them? Do you have a little museum or something? Um, well, some of them are next door. Mm -hmm. Go and have a look at them if you like. Mm, I um, some of them. Um, so I, I race nearly all of them. I mean, well, I have raced at one time or another nearly all of them. Um, the... The other thing we're doing with them is um, trying to get them to earn their living by renting them out for films or photography or for advertisements or for displays or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, and that's really what we're going to start with this office is primarily. See, that's very interesting. I mean, 
Sorry, I have so many other interests. My uh, opening statement of uh, you know music being a sideline, it seems to be well, it's more not. to the I mean, point. Okay. No, no, I didn't mean like that, you know. Yeah, yeah it's really a good, good opener, but I was, I'd, no, but, I'd always deny it. But you always, you know, you, you really have uh, so many other interests that uh, Pink Floyd yeah. only can fit in. Well, I would, um, if Pink Floyd was busy, I would uh, make sure the other interests could manage themselves. Mm. I mean, something like the cars can manage themselves or someone else can manage them. The recording studio definitely can manage itself. And I hope when we put, we're putting a new solid state logic desk in that uh, it'll be very busy with other people. I don't really want to be able to use it at all. I'd rather it was absolutely full most of the time. I've never wished to have the studio in, you know, at home. So I've always been particularly interested, particularly as I live like, in like the office. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, you used to live near uh, uh, to Roger Waters, didn't you? I used to, but he's now moved uh, out, out of town. I see, so um, you are the only one in London. I am left. Yeah. <laughs> can you go back and um, can you remember any anecdotes of uh, about Pink Floyd? What happened? Anything interesting? Um, well, I mean, it was all interesting. It's, you I know, to tell I know, me yeah. more specifically what sort of area. I can't think that anecdotes is always the same. Anything yeah, happened on a tour or, you know, something in a studio. You know, yeah, the funny stuff. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about it. I remember the last time I talked to you, uh, after the fictitious part, we were, we were talking about the early days of uh, Pink Floyd and how you started playing the music you became renowned for. And um, your explanation was that you didn't know how to play proper rhythm and blues. <laughs> yes, and the visuals became because uh, you know the music it was incorporated with the music and so on you know things like that I really don't know anything in more detail or things like Roger Waters when he played Napworth when was it 76 or whatever so, and he walked through the auditorium nobody saw him nobody recognized him mm -hmm. yes well I mean that those sort of things happen all the time I mean I think the, the sort of uh, most extraordinary things were the, the big equipment things like the business of the pig, you know, that escaped from Oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, which is, is the, my biggest memory of the sort of things that happened. And all those inflatables that, um, that inflated, we built a pyramid that also inflated, which we had in America. I didn't know about that. And we just did it for America. It was an enormous 60-foot square pyramid. And uh, we cut that loose one night and it just went. <laughs> And it got about 500 foot into the air, and it, it's a very bad flying shape. If you're ever thinking of building an aeroplane like a pyramid, get it. And it just inverted, and the, the center of it popped out. The Americans thought that was fantastic. One of them, I can remember now one of them saying, my God, it's giving birth. <laughs> the sort of center piece came popping out and went up. Well, of course, this enormous mass of canvas then came down. But uh, fortunately, no one was underneath it, because it would have taken ages to get them out of it. I mean, <laughs> Has anything happened to you personally whilst you were with the, I mean, touring? Um, in, in terms of what? I don't know, something unusual, you know. Well, lots of unusual things, I suppose. Um, I mean, tours have made up that it, there isn't, you know, one looks back over 15 years or 16 years of touring, and there's nothing that springs up as that was really extraordinary because mm -hmm. each tour is made up of a whole mass of little stories. I mean, there are some nights that are really quite dull, and other nights where the road crew go on the rampage and the hotel's in uproar and, you know, there's trouble. Um, and, and things where you're bored, and so, I mean, on tour the American tours where you're looking I mean the nice memories quite often are things that aren't very unusual or dramatic but just the way you spent a couple of days while you were there together and you know you all went tubing down the river or, um, or played tennis for three days or something like that rather than thinking god I remember that incredible thing it, the, the, those sort of events tend to be um more to do with the strange people that you meet on the tour, particularly. And the very strange thing is that you can have as much security as you like all around the place, and the only people that will ever get through to backstage are the real lunatics. You know, if it's your mother or 
the girlfriend or whatever, they can never get backstage. But if it's some real spacey person who wants to say, you know, I've really, I've heard the music in the Spurs, and I just know that you're God, or something like that, they always just breeze straight past the security guards. I don't know what happens, but they're always there, knocking on the band room door. They must have a more imagination. <laughs> yes, perhaps they hypnotise them. Does it happen to you when, when um, I mean, after all these years, that you sit at home and read or something, and you get those mental pictures of a band in a particular situation or something? Do you get those little flashbacks? Um, not just sort of sitting. I mean, I suppose something might would trigger it, particularly if you're watching a band on television or talking to someone. You know, particularly talking because you, someone mentions a city or something like that. That's why it's so difficult when you say, yeah, right. you know, tell me the story. I can't think of anything. If you said to me, New do York, you remember? New York, so and so. Yeah, and I'd say, oh yes, that's the time when the pig is getting, you know, something else mm. happened or the, uh, the lunatic jumped from the stalls into the, onto the stage or something like that, you know. Um, so it, the memory works in a peculiar way. Yeah, I know, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> do, so you do get them, I mean, those uh, memories, you know, flashbacks. Oh, yes. Out of the so. bluff. Of and I think one of the curious things is sometimes when we talk, when the band are talking about what happened in the past, yeah. how we remember things in very different ways. And so we'll argue for hours about yeah, whether, do you remember that guy at the time Dave rode the motorbike through the restaurant? And we'll go, Yes, Denver, 1972. And someone else goes, don't be stupid, it wasn't Denver, it was uh, um, you know, Cleveland or something. And we have these, and we're absolutely convinced of what with of the memory we have. You know, but so you're still coming again with Roger? With Roger? Um, not a lot, but I mean, I'll, I'll speak to him. Uh, we, we meet fairly regularly anyway, just to talk about the business and what we're doing and past catalogue and all the rest of it. Um, and I see Roger socially a bit. I mean, not an enormous part, but we'll go out to dinner and um, meet at things. And I mean, I, I think I still look upon Roger as um, one of my best friends. I mean, he's been a friend for a long time. I mean, a very serious friend, because when we have an argument, you know, we really have problem, the ones where you really hate someone and don't want to speak to them for a year. But... Uh, I still look upon him as someone who certainly, probably, we know more about each other than almost anyone else but close friends, just because we've been around together for so long. You know, it's a friendship that goes back over 20 years now, sort of before the band. That's what's sort of curious about it. Is it 20 years? Mm. Well, 20 years, because I knew Roger three years before the band was working. And does it feel like that? Yeah, like 20 real tight. Five. <laughs>